part of the historical studies ongoing effort uh, to not only preserve but also to showcase the best of historical uh, tra traditions, this evening uh, we are sponsoring The Ghost and Mr. Dickens. Serving as a dramatic medium for the return of Charles Dickens is actor, playwright, author, and historical researcher Mark McPherson. Mr. McPherson has performed two, on two other occasions for the Grossman Historical Society, Theodore Roosevelt, the man in his arena, and Winston Chir Churchill, his finest hours. McPherson says he's looking forward to channeling the spirit of the creator of Oliver Twist, David Copperfield, and A Christmas Carol. Uh, regarded, A Christmas Carol, of course, regarded by many as the greatest and most enduring Yuletide classic in English literature. Uh, Mr. McPherson, who lives in Brazil, is pleased to once again be asked to come back uh, and to speak as one of his heroes, Charles Dickens. Adding that quote many years ago, I elected to add a dramatic presentation featuring Dickens, if only as an additional way to celebrate the Christmas season. However, my research has increasingly shown the how and why of why the author wrote his classic tale of Scrooge, Bob Cratchit, and Tiny Tim is of equal, if not greater, interest. In fact, Dickens was so appalled by the conditions of the homeless, the ill, and the orphan, uh, and the destitute in England at that time, that he wished to raise the ghost of an idea in 1843, and he did this in the form of the Christmas Carol. Also, and unbeknownst to many, is the fact that Dickens was one of the first writers to gain popular fame by publicly presenting his favorite works to audiences in Britain, America, and throughout the world. As with his repertory of other one-man shows, uh, which have previously featured subjects as diverse as Arthur uh, Doyle, uh, Winston Churchill, George Bernard Shaw, uh, Wyatt Earp, Mark Twain, Theodore Roosevelt, and recently, right next door at Christ Church, C.S. Lewis, Lewis, Mr. Ford admits that his special liking is uh, most of Dickens. The Christmas season is an intense and dramatically charged moment in the year. Dickens himself was aware that it was a sort of spiritual harbor for many people in many lands where they celebrate or even recognize, where they didn't even recognize or celebrate the season of Christmas. For that reason, we are celebrating the quaint, curious, and most ancient customs of the Yuletide. They may range from the true meanings of the evergreen tree, Santa Claus, mistletoe, Yuletide uh, log, and even the genesis of certain carols sung at Christmas. Moreover, <coughs> moreover uh, we will bring to the stage Dickens' own recreation of his immortal characters in a Christmas carol. This will even include a replica of the stage lantern, which Dickens had built for his countless dramatic uh, performances, and adding to this ferocity, Mr. Uh, uh, McPherson, be using Dickens' own scripted stage version, dramatizing portions of the Christmas Carol. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Charles Dickens. Well, ladies and gentlemen, yes, indeed, I am Charles Dickens, the inimitable one. I'm so very pleased to be here to serve as your unofficial ambassador for the wonderful holiday season which is about to overtake us. I would like to thank Mr. Skinner for actually uh, using most of my material. I, I, it's going to be a very short show now, I think. But uh, in point of fact, I am very pleased to be back here in Gross Point. I have been staying upon my arrival at... Uh, a place further down the river, a gross eel. I wonder, is everything gross in Michigan? I have no real uh, sense of that, I suppose, but uh, I suppose I should begin. I would imagine that being very literate, very historical people, um, you know my name from certain of my written works, because, of course, I am by profession a humble scribe. You thought I was going to say great author, didn't you? No, I'm much more honest than that. But, oh, a few things that younger members of my audience, uh, those who are growing up, might be compelled to study in their classrooms. Uh, great Expectations, Oliver Twist, and then I suppose something akin to what most of the ones I'm seeing at this moment, who are, like myself, growing down, uh, might recall a Dombey and Son, uh, any number of things, including a little book I wrote in 1843. Yes, madam, you heard correctly. I am very well preserved. <laughs> Has to do with walking. You'll hear about that in a moment. A little book called Christmas Carol. Now, I am quite amazed how it is that for all the things that I have written, there are certain works which loom large. This is the only one that seems to have positively its own form of life, this time of the rolling year. 
And I hope you will appreciate the fact that this work was written not only to be read or enjoyed at Christmas time, but there was a very specific reason for it. But I appear here, I have been traveling across your great country, and as a matter of fact, I am uh, probably on a very tight schedule in as much as I have a ship, which is to carry me back home in time to be there for the holidays, so I shall make haste of sorts. Here I am upon your stage. I am no stranger to either writing, of course, or stages. As a matter of fact, I rather pioneered the notion of an author speaking about his own works, which may seem in some sense redundant. I once put the notion to a group of my colleagues, uh, got them together and, and, and read a work, and I said, what would you think of the notion of me performing this before a group of, well, the public? No, not quite the figure, man, rather in for a dig. I, I mean, I'm not, not, not all the professional artistic thing to do, said one of my colleagues. Well, I'm pleased to say that he's been proven wrong. And there are uh, a number of authors who have uh, followed in those footsteps. Um, any number of them. Uh, uh, since I am a figure who is able to step in and out of time and space, of course, among my other talents, I can tell you that people of your own, your own day, uh, there's a lady named Rowling, I think, who has written a series of books, and she's drawn absolutely fantastical numbers of people just to hear her read. Now this would be, I suppose, uh, counter to the notion of what one of my friends thought. Yes, you're going to stand up there, and you're going to recite or read from a bleak house, and you're going to get people who will leave their own houses, whether they're bleak or not, uh, buy tickets in order to be read to, you think that's going to work. Well, I have news for him, and for all those doubters, it did work. And I am able to visit many different places, and uh, I have come to terms with appreciating America. You know, my first trip over, it was rather, rather difficult, and I wrote a book thereafter called Martin Chuzzlewit, in which I took America and Americans rather to task. But uh, I've come to like you so much more. I, uh, I feel rather like the, uh, well, the uh, young man who said that uh, when he was growing up, he could not stand the sight of his father because he said that old man was so, so terribly stupid. This was at the age of 14. He said, however, by the time he had reached 21 years of age, he was amazed at how much his father had learned in seven years. <laughs> It takes a matter of an exposure, I suppose. And, and so it is that I am here to share my works and also the notion I have been informed by the members of the society, whom I am in your great debt for bringing me here, and also Mr. Rousseau, uh, who take a Frenchman, I suppose, um, to uh, aid in the cause, Lockmore Chrysler Plymouth. I'm told it is a dealership. I am uncertain as to what they deal in, but we are in their debt as well, so keep that in mind. This time of the year, we're very appreciative of, of generous people. Um, but how does an artist come to produce his art? How does a writer write? Does it simply uh, come there automatically, uh, out of the clouds, like an epiphany? No, of course it does not. We must be inspired. We must be able to somehow draw, squeeze the sponge dry, you might say, and then it, take the liquid that we, 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 we take and steal and put it upon the page. Well, I think that much of what I may be telling you about myself, for certain of you, will come as a bit of a surprise. I have come to represent a period of time. And yet I think that hopefully by the time I leave this stage this evening, you will realize there is a very short distance between my time and yours with regard to certain circumstances. Finally, there will be the matter of ghosts. I think this must have attracted many of you. Many of you are probably thinking, well, is it not more appropriate to talk of ghosts 
during the, the period of All Hallows, when uh, the, the spooks and the spirits are, are, are riding through the air and the leaves are falling from the trees. Why at Christmas time? Well, in my country, the tradition of ghost stories has always been very rich. And I suspect this has a good deal to do with the uh, change in the barometer, the arrival of the Arctic breezes and the, the roiling clouds and the troubled skies. In ancient times, what was called the Yule Tide came at this time of year in which the natural warmth disappeared. And so men clustered closer to the fire and they built larger fires, bonfires, all sorts of piles in order as if to propitiate the sun to return its warmth. And so by simulating light and warmth, they also celebrated. A very ancient tradition this time of the year. As a matter of fact, the Roman Saturnalia, the celebration of the Feast of Saturn, the Winter Solstice Festivals, took place round about the 17th of December. And it's no surprise that Christians, among their very many other attributes, and this is not being critical, simply appropriated a good deal of the old custom particularly the Yule customs. So it is that because of the need to return to that war, there was a number of attempts to keep the shadows at bay. And I think that the thing that has always fascinated me about the Yule tide is that it's rather like the moon. It has two sides. It has the light. It has the dark. It has the shadowy. It has the mysterious. There is no Yule tide without it. And because of that, Eventually, in my day, when we celebrated this, this juncture of the year, we made it mysterious. We turned it to our own ends. More of that in a moment. I think the ghosts that you may see conjured here tonight have a good deal to do with my own past. You may well say that I am the ghost of Charles Dickens. I am speaking to you of Christmas's past, Christmas present, I suppose Christmas is still to come. Now, I have played many roles. I have been an actor, as well as a writer, as a dramatist. I love being on the stage because you get to play parts, but don't all of you, each and every one of you play parts, every day. I mean, we are all living a drama, which is perhaps, according to some, been assigned to us the moment of our birth by the great author. And as we grow older, we speak our lines, and we find our places on the stage, and sometimes we are the principals, sometimes we are the supporting actors. But it is always an individual drama that we see out to the end. I've been asked whether my life was happy, whether it was creative. Well, I was born, which is a good start, in the year 1812. My uh, Parents, John and Elizabeth Dickens, um, a very nice couple of people. My father worked at the Naval Pay Office. My mother had aspirations of uh, running a household, being the mother of many children, and also uh, perhaps of having her own teaching establishment, which she had a, a go at at one point. We lived in Chatham, in the countryside, and I was uh, a student at Dr. Giles Academy. The other boys and I loved uh, the Academy, and we all wore white beaver top hats. We called ourselves Giles Cats, and we had a good time in class learning all sorts of things. Um, this was fine until my father's job situation changed, and we were compelled to move toward the great city. The smoke the stink, as it's been called, London, for all of its vagaries. My father's job, as I say, altered, and so, in short time, did our circumstances. I think it had something to do with the fact that the available pounds, shillings, and pence, well, they were not as available as they needed to be. In order to supplement the family's income, I was put to work in an establishment called Warren's Blacking Factory. Now, blacking was rather like the, the polish you would use for shoes. And I was put to work with a number of other 
young people um, doing various tasks, gluing labels onto the, the bottles of blacking. And this was a period of time in what was known as the Industrial Revolution. Many people came from the countrysides into the cities, but life there was difficult, particularly if one did not have a regular income. And if one did not spend carefully, one could wind up in debtor's prison. Well, this is exactly what happened to my family. And at the age of 12, I was working in the black factory, and my father's debts compelled him to be sent to the Marshall Sea Prison, the debtor's prison. It was not uncommon for entire families to go and live in the prison until such a time as when the debts could be paid. And so it was that my family occupied a small room in the prison. I, however, did not live with them. I was, what you might laughingly say, gainfully employed at the blacking factory. And so I spent the work week working. And at the end of that week, I would visit my mother and father and brothers and sisters in the prison. And when the gates closed, I would return to my very small room where I kept a very small loaf and a bit of cheese, and I wandered the city. No support, no consolation, no care. I was entirely on my own, and I saw that great city in its many shapes and its strange hues, romantic shapes, horrific shapes, I saw people living on the streets, living off of the streets, living like animals, many of them. Well, the story does improve because my father was able to leave Marshall Sea Prison. Thereafter, I remained employed at the Blacking Factory until my father discovered that I was so industrious and my output with another young fellow was so great that the manager of the factory took us and put us by the front window so that people could see these little machines working so hastily. And my father said, not my son, and took me out. Which was rather a relief to me. And I was placed back in school for a bit. Well, home again, school. But before long, I realized that my opportunities were not to be, well, provided for in the sense that I might have gone on to a better school or even university. And so I took upon myself a course of court reporting, a form of stenography. You know, the courts in my day, as in yours, require testimonies to be taken and statements to be recorded. And so I was able to learn this trade. And before long, I was working as a reporter in the courts. I looked around me, however, and I felt that perhaps I would rather report on other things. I had a keen eye. I had, even though I was unaware of it at the time, a writer's eye at that time. And I thought I could write a story. Did I dare? Finally, I completed a manuscript and put it into the postal box of a publication and did not even include my own name. Lo and behold, I anxiously sought out that publication a week or so later only to see my story in print. And so I continued to make submissions and then I began to use a, a, a pen name of Boz. Stories by Boz. Well, eventually my identity was revealed, and along the way my stories became very popular and in demand, and I found myself to be a fledgling writer. And at that time I also fell in love. Maria Biedner. Maria was a beautiful young girl from a very good family. I uh, courted her zealously. I managed to equip myself with my earnings, with the fashionable coat and trousers and waistcoats, and seals and watch chains, and pointed shoes, and I was quite the gentleman of fashion, but not quite the gentleman 
for Maria's parents. I recall sitting across the table, seeing her father stare at me as if I was some vile creature and certainly not good enough for their daughter. I'm certain there are fathers of daughters in the audience right now who know exactly what I mean. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, Maria was a bit of a coquette and uh, they all knew I was bound to get serious. And I was on the brink of doing so when it was announced that Maria was being sent abroad for her education to be broadened. In reality, the court reporter could have reported in order to get her away from young Charles Dickens, who has no future at all. Well, Maria left. I pined a bit. And I eventually uh, continued to write, and I pined, and I fell in love, and I married. I suppose in the back of my mind I thought, well, if Maria Beatnell ever reappears, I should be a famous author, with a beautiful wife, grand home, many, many children. As for that grand home, I recalled walking through the countryside on one occasion years earlier with my father. And there was a great house called Gads Hill Place. And my father took me by the hand and we paused. And I imagined what it would be like, what sort of person could be living in such a house. And he said, you know, Charles, if you apply yourself and you become a very great man, perhaps one day you will live in a house like that. Follow that. Well, I continued to write and I found success. I created uh, the Pickwick Club, a number of other stories which brought smiles and uh, broad laughter to my audience. And I became very interested in reflecting my world. Some things I could not get enough of. Some things repelled me. I had an acquaintance named Maria Burdett Coos. And she was very wealthy. She was a philanthropist. And she said, Charles, I would like you to see something. I'd like you to accompany me. And I did. We had gone to a place which was called a rabbit school. I don't know if you're familiar with in my day, a ragged school was the best attempt at providing some meager hope for the children who were unfortunate, who were living off the streets, who had no opportunities. And so they could come to the ragged schools and be offered a modicum of food and warmth and perhaps Christian education, scriptural direction, before being sent out without direction onto those very miserable streets again. Well, the day that I visited, I remember the creaking of the rotten stair beneath my feet and the damp feeling of the wall, and as I ascended and found myself beholding such a sight, one room was the little boys and the other were the little girls. Some of them were ill, some of them were caught in what looked like a very bad case of influenza or worse, dark circles under eyes, a haunted feverish look whether they were ill or not, scarfing down the meager bits of food that they were offered. And the tragedy of this occurred to me because this was a reflection of our local world, our urban life in Greater London. People foraging for food. Children reduced to crime in many cases, or sent into the factories. Warren's blacking factory was probably a, a very kind opportunity in contrast to what many of the children who found themselves, we children, in factories doing 13, 14, 15 hours work for nothing practically. And they might spend the rest of their lives fated. They might earn a few pennies, as I did, six shillings a week, which was probably grand compared to what some of those children made. Bring them back to their parents and 
buy some crusts of bread, or some gruel, or some cheese, or whatever. But what sort of a life for a child is that? What sort of a life for an adult was that? I thought to myself, something must be done. Something must be done. I have always been an inveterate walker, some nights, 10, 20, 30 miles, just to think things out, to work out a problem. And I found myself thinking, well, I shall, I shall draw attention to the social ills surrounding us, and I will write, yes, I will write a pamphlet. I will write an appeal to the people of England on behalf of the poor man's child. Yes, a pamphlet. Who would read a pamphlet? The year was 1843. And after having seen those ragged schools, the notion came to me in one of those walks. Christmas was nigh, this time of such a spiritual harbor, when the past and the present seem conjoined, when those we have lost seem even nearer. When joy seems to be in abundance, and when, for some unaccountable reason, people's spirits were turned toward doing good during the singular month, and then went about their own wicked ways once the rolling year had advanced. How could I change any of that? Well, I attempted to raise the ghost of an idea. story of Christmas. But first, let us speak of Christmas. I wonder, do you ever wonder where the most obvious symbols of the season come from? Now we've spoken of the Yuletide, the ancient festival of the, the winter solstice, but do you ever wonder? I wonder myself, how they manage the incandescent Christmas candle? Why do we adorn our homes with boughs of evergreen? Why the evergreen at all? What about Santa Claus, stockings by the chimney? Hmm? Why do we have the wreaths of evergreen? What about the holly and the ivy? What about, yes madam, you knew I'd come to it this <laughs> celebrated in a variety of ways, but Christmas or Christ's Mass, it's quite old, but the significance of assigning to this time of year, because it was assigned. The year 354, Pope Leo assigned the date, December 25th. There's some debate as to whether or not it was assigned to be closer to Saturnalia, because this was the feasting time when everyone celebrated. The ancient Yuletide celebrations would be such that uh, there was a time of misrule. As a matter of fact, one of our latter-day traditions was to make a, uh, a plum pudding, or perhaps even a fruit cake, and to insert a bean and some other objects in the cake, and whoever drew the bean would become the Lord of Misrule. And this goes back to the olden days when Masters would pretend for that celebration to be slaves, and slaves would get to emulate the master, the lord of misrule. Well, those ancient times of summoning forth the heat of the sun, the burning of the Yule logs, interesting, I think, because in due time, not everyone could go out and fell a gigantic oak, or if you had, where would you put it? If you had a small home or a cottage, some people did not even have a hearth. Well, in certain continental countries, it became very popular to pour spices or put ribbons over the, the log and set it afire, and it would be associated with the sacred time of the year. Eventually, however, the translation of the Yuletide flame, the light, became translated from the great Yule log to the candle. Now, in my own day, which 
was associated with the great Queen Victoria. The symbol of the candle became very common. As a matter of fact, on my way here this evening, I saw candles in the windows. I'm not certain why the flames were not flickering, but I saw them. And this goes back to the time in my day of when candles were placed in the window to say to the wayfarer, friend, there is hope, there is food, there is help and rest for you. The tradition of putting the candle in the window. The tree itself is a Germanic tradition. It is said that it goes back a long, long way to a time when one good Christian cut down a an oak of the sacred oak of the Druids and offered them a symbol of the evergreen to represent the Christian faith instead. And that, that that tree being evergreen wound up symbolizing the new faith in a wonderful fashion. Uh, long ago, the Germanic tree was adorned and apples were placed upon it and in due time small presents on the branches. I imagine over further time, some of those presents fell off the branches and wandered under the tree, as they might well today. The uh, symbol of the wreath, of that eternal source of energy of the evergreen, the holly and the ivy representing the Christians, the uh, sharply pointed leaves representing the crown of thorns, the red berries representing the blood shed by Jesus Christ. The notion of the old beliefs carried into the new. The notion of the sacred oak tree and the mistletoe which sprung from it. Translated in my good day to the notion of a, a young man may kiss any young lass and she cannot say no if it is beneath the sacred mistletoe. So it is. Certain basic symbols. And in my day, the Prince Consort of Victoria, Albert, brought an evergreen tree which was decorated in the Windsor Castle. And it became a popular tradition thereafter to have decorated trees. I mean, we had cellars in London, some of them featuring 40 foot tall trees. One can only hope that one had a living room or a parlor to be able to accommodate. But the notion of having the symbols of light, the evergreen, the candle, let us not forget Santa Claus. Now I heard a rumor that someone told me that there are certain people in America who believe Santa Claus was a fiction. It's a wonderful poem by a man named Clement Moore, who was an eyewitness to the very notion that Santa Claus appeared, a purely journalistic account, I think you all know, and, and Moore saw this jolly old elf. Well, of course, what he saw was perhaps a reflection of the notions of a 4th century Turkish bishop, St. Nicholas, who was a good man and uh, known and well-loved by many. And in his village there were two young girls who were betrothed, but they did not have money for a dowry. And it is said that Nicholas managed to uh, scale the roof of their house and toss some gold coins down the chimney. Well, what do you think happened? The coins fell down the chimney, and one of them bounced into a stocking which was drying by the chimney at the time. You see how these traditions come to pass. Quite remarkable, I think, in their own ways. The history of Christmas is fascinating as well, because in 1224, Francis of Assisi, petitioned the Pope so that nativity cribs could be placed. Now, in some of the churches, cribs had existed, but the scenes of the manger and the stable and the figures became popular in the 13th century by official decree. In the 12th century, there was great religious celebration. Henry II saw to this. He said, this is a wonderful time for merriment, but also this sacred moment when we may celebrate. And so he sponsored plays and, and masks. In the 13th century, Henry III continued the notion of celebration, had a feast in which 600 oxen were slain. That's a good deal of meat, people. Can you imagine sitting at a table with that much meat? 
by the 16th century, Henry VIII, whom I'm certain you can visualize, a big man with big ideas, he got into the notion that this was a time when sacred music should be, should be sponsored and, and plays and all sorts of merriment should, should celebrate the notion of the Nativity and Christ's Mass. Well, this was well and good until we come to the 16th century. The Puritan influence was so strong that do you know, in the year 1552 in England, Christmas celebration of the Nativity was banned. Seven years later, in this country, in Massachusetts, it was banned. Christmas celebration of the Nativity was illegal. Can you imagine anyone trying to make Christmas illegal? trying to hide something like Christmas. These Puritans attempted to take Christmas and make Good Friday out of it. it recalls the story of the good Puritan woman who, who, who went to church early in the morning and she would be going again in the afternoon, but she had been told by uh, her spiritual leader that, of course, you did not make merry and celebrate Christmas. You're very dour, very dutiful you did not celebrate, well, she felt there was still reason to celebrate, and she decided to do so by making herself a small bowl of stew. Now this was, she thought, perhaps a bit licentious of her, because it was a bit more fancy than the fair she had every day, but she thought to celebrate the season, she gathered the, the recipe ingredients, and, and the stew was on the hob by the fire, and it was nearly ready. She was fine until what do you suspect? A knock on the door. She looked out a small curtain window and there stood the good reverend gentleman who had been lecturing to them only that morning. As she could not abide the good gentleman seeing her, her wanton celebration at this time of the year and she quickly took the bowl off the hob and she put it under her, her little straw cot. The hot bowl under the straw cot. Well, you can imagine what happened. The cot caught fire, the stew went up, the cottage went up. But you cannot hide Christmas. Perhaps that is the motive behind all of this, you see, because the notion of what the Puritans tried to do did not stop many who had the memory of the Yuletide's past. And they were maintained underground, you might say, until finally, I would imagine, by the 19th century, there were artists and muse musicians and poets who decided to celebrate Christmas and do it in their own unique ways. Do you know, originally, the idea of some of the sacred songs, or at least the popular songs of the period, reflected the old Yule, the, the, the notion of the deck the halls with boughs of holly, or good King Wenceslas looked down on the feast of Stephen, or we three kings. Now, it's rather fortunate for you that I'm not accompanied by musicians, so I should not torture you in that regard. But the church was quick enough to know that this was a time to extend the gospel lessons centuries and centuries ago, and some of the greatest carols reflecting the scriptural stories. Half the herald angels came upon a, a midnight clear. Ancient themes brought into modern times, including that wonderful, perhaps holiest of songs, Silent Night, which is interesting. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, as the great Byron once observed. The uh, composer of that song intended for it to be played on the church organ in Austria. Well, as it happened, the pesky church mice got behind and then into the organ and gnawed away at it. And the poor gentleman was not able to perform it for Christmas Mass as it was intended. And so, being resourceful, he decided to present it on a guitar. And Silent Night was first offered to the congregation that way. Think about it the next time you hear that song played on anything other than a guitar. Well, this brings us to the merriment aspect of the season. Apart from all the sacred associations we have, 
We have those sacred associations that were converted into the idea of this fun-loving figure, Saint Nicholas, Father Christmas as we call him in my country, Santa Claus, as you well know him, and of course the wonderful songs of merriment. You look like a very astute group of people. You have probably heard of the 12 days of Christmas, the 12 days during which that Yule feast would have lasted. There is a song that I, I have been made aware of, and it celebrates each of those days. I wonder how adept you would be in identifying the rest of, uh, of it. If I said that there were 12 ladies dancing, there would be 11 lords are leaping, very good, 10, I beg your pardon, sir, 10, drummers drumming, yes, this is rather like an auction. Nine, pipers, piping. piping, that's what they do. Eight, maids and milking. Seven, six, five, four, holly birds. Three, two, and a partridge, where? In a pantry. In a pantry. Yes, what a festive group you are. Very good. <laughs> you know, originally the notion of sending cards, Christmas cards, uh, did not work out. The company printed them and showed a family around a table, and they did not really um, take off in a very large way. I think the thing that inspired it later, by 1870, is the, the, the halfpenny post came to be, and the Postal Service offered it, and the next thing you know, people were beginning to send one another cards, and they were having their trees in their home, and they were decking their homes with the uh, boughs of holly, and they were placing the, the stockings by the chimney with care, and they were lighting their candles. And while all this was going on, during the fine old month, those people were still living on the streets. Those children were still in those ragged schools. And I again thought to myself, how could I impact upon it? The notion of the pamphlet was useless. And I thought I could write something that people would, would see a mirror of their present and consider their past. And how could I write something that would say to each and every person, there is time and a way to help. To help those in need, to help yourself, to redeem yourself at this most redemptive time of the year. And so, as I found myself walking, I suddenly became haunted by my own creative ghosts, characters which appeared to me. There would be an old miserly figure, his name would be Scrooge, and, and he would have a, a, a fellow working for him named Cratchit. And, and Cratchit would have a, a little son who was lame, whose name would be Tiny Tim. There would be ghosts. Yes, there would be ghosts. And when I got the notion I had to begin to write, and it came upon me like a blizzard of words. And, and so it was that in a matter of six short weeks, that story was completed and it was launched, and I published it at my own expense, and it was received. And it has been well received ever since. Now, with your permission, I would like to uh, share with you, which, as I have done with audiences, it seems throughout the globe, throughout my own country, that example of the author reading his own works, if you can get by the presumption of it, I should like to introduce you to at least the first stave of what became known as a Christmas Carol, in which you would see some of these ghosts begin to strut the stage. Marley was dead. To begin with. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and
and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was, well, good upon the exchange for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Well, of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for, oh, I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. There it yet stood, years afterward, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was called Scrooge and Marley. Now, sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, sometimes Marley. He answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand, and the grindstone was Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, Clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence upon him. No warmth could warm, no cold could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely, but Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see us? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way of such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. When they saw him coming on, they would hug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then they would wag their tails as though they said, No eye is better than an evil eye, Dark Master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Well, once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, and it was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather, and the city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Now Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it. For well, Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely, as that clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle. Which effort, being a man of strong imagination, notwithstanding, A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Ah, said Scrooge. Humbug! Christmas, a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. Out upon a merry, merry Christmas.
Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? <laughs> Why, if I had my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly right through his heart. He should. in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it. <laughs> but you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. <laughs> there are many things from which I might have derived good by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time, when it has come round, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow travelers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good. And it will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Well, the clock in the tank involuntarily applauded. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to the nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Well, Scrooge said that he would see him in, well, he went the full expressions extremity. Thank you. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why? Why? Did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle. But you never came to see me before that happened. Why well, give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We've never had any quarrel to which I have been a but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas. And I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. And so, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. Well, his nephew left the room without an angry word notwithstanding. And the clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now they stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and they bowed to him. Ah, oh, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Uh, have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marty has been dead in seven years. He died uh, seven years ago this very night. Oh, <clears throat> well, at uh, this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, uh, taking up a pen, it is more than uh, usually desirable that we 
should make some slight provision for the poor and the destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries, and hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. But under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when warmth is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall we put you down for? Nothing. Ah, you wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. <clears throat> well, at length, the hour for shutting up the counting house arrived, and with an ill will, Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. You're quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. Yes, sir. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Uh, I suppose you must have the whole day. But you'll be here earlier next morning. Well, the clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, went down a slide at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of it being Christmas Eve, and then he ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his bankers, Went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard. The building was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house, except that it was very large. Also that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in London. And yet, Scrooge, having the key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face with a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in the dark cellar. 
was not angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. Well, as Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again, and, and, and he said, Blah! and he closed the door with a bang. Well, the sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above, every cask in the wine merchant cellar below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes, all of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. And so he, he fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs. Slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went up Scrooge went, not carrying a button, for it being very dark, for darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to wish to do that. Well, sitting room, Bedroom, lumber room, yes, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, yes, hmm. nobody under the sofa. Small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, little saucepan full of gruel, because Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody closet. <laughs> well, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Well, quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. And thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat. He put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and he sat down before the very low fire to take his gruel. And as he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose, now forgotten, with a chamber in the highest story of the building, and it was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexpressible dread, that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It rang, and it rang, and soon it rang out loudly, and soon so did every bell in the house. Well, this was succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. And then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, and then coming up the stairs, and then coming straight towards his door. It came on through the heavy door, and a specter passed into the room before his eyes. And upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him! This is why one needs an assistant. <laughs> Marley's ghost! Yes, the same face, the very same. Marley, in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, his body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Now, Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked at the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief 
bound about its head and chin. He was still incredulous. How now, said Scrooge, what do you want with me? Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Uh, can you sit? C can you sit down? I can. Well, do it then. Well, Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Well, because a little thing affects them, a slight disorder of the stomach, uh, makes them cheap. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a, a fragment of underdone potato. Yeah. There is more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Well, Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his horror. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped upon its breast. Mercy, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me, in life my spirit never rode beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead, and traveling all the time. You travel fast. On the wings of the wind. You might have got over a good quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, blood. 